Tonight we begin in a little courthouse in Topeka, Kansas. We begin with this guy. Mr. Klein, do you yourself believe that abortion should be made illegal? Do I myself? Yes. about that. I'm also anti-murder and I put a lot of murderers away too. I followed the law. That was Phil Klein, the former Republican Attorney General for the great state of Kansas. And he was not in that courthouse that day to put away a murderer. He was in that courthouse that day because he was on trial. He had been hauled up on ethics charges for professional misconduct. And that drama came to an end today when the Kansas Supreme Court finally took away Phil Klein's license to practice law. They took his license, and he was the attorney general of that state. The real drama in this case has always been that this Phil Klein thing has been taking place against the backdrop of just incredible violence in Kansas. In 1993, this woman walked up to a Kansas doctor who'd just gotten into his car at the clinic where he worked, and she shot him. Uh, she shot him through both of his arms. He had been attacked before. His clinic had been firebombed before. But in 1993, they actually shot him. He came back to work the next day, bandaged up. He said he thought it was important to show his face, to show that he would not be intimidated. The woman who shot him, Shelly Shannon, went to prison for shooting Dr. George Tiller in Kansas in 1993. But the radical anti-abortion movement saw her as a hero for having shot him. While she was in prison, she got more than two dozen visits from this guy, Scott Roeder. He told the writer Amanda Robb that it was during those prison visits to see the woman who had shot Dr. George Tiller that he started to think that maybe he should be the guy to finish off what she had started. Shelly Shannon had tried to kill Dr. Tiller, but Scott Roeder decided that he should be the one to finish the job. And in May 2009, indeed, Scott Roeder stalked Dr. George Tiller at his church on a Sunday morning, entered the church, and killed him. When the police pulled Scott Roeder over that morning after the killing, he had a post-it note on his dashboard with the name and number for the policy director of the anti-abortion group Operation Rescue on that post-it note. So now it's Scott Roeder who's in prison in Kansas, this time for having killed Dr. Tiller. And now the person who has struck up the jailhouse friendship with him is a Kansas woman named Angel Dillard. She told the Associated Press that just as the woman who shot George Tiller had been an inspiration to Scott Roeder, Scott Roeder is now an inspiration to her. She said, quote, quite honestly, as soon as I heard about it, I realized that he was able to accomplish what those of us in the pro-life movement had not been able to accomplish. We put millions of man hours in, protested millions of dollars, attempts at legislation, and we were butting our heads up against the wall. We were not getting anywhere. But with one move, meaning the murder, Scott Roeder was able to accomplish what we had not been able to do. So he followed his convictions, and I admire that. That woman uh, is now the subject of a Justice Department lawsuit for making what the government says are death threats against another abortion doctor, a doctor who tried to offer the first abortion services in that part of Kansas after Dr. Tiller was killed. Angel Dillard sent this letter to that doctor at her home. It said, in part, if Dr. Tiller could speak from hell, he would tell you what a soulless existence you are purposefully considering. Thousands of people are already looking into your background, not just in Wichita, but from all over the U.S. They know your habits and your routines. They know where you shop. They know who your friends are and what you drive and where you live. You will be checking under your car because maybe today will be the day somebody places an explosive under it. We will not let abomination continue without doing everything we can to stop it. That doctor, thus threatened in Kansas, never opened up a facility in Kansas to provide abortions. In part, she told us on this show it was hard to find a place to open a clinic, given that there is, well, a whole movement of people in Kansas who have proven by their actions that they will firebomb you and shoot you if you open up a clinic like that. And they continue to threaten that that is what they will do after they've already proven that they have done it. And in the face of that record of murder and violence and intimidation in Kansas, what has always been the most amazing thing from a national perspective, from a broad-based American perspective, is that in Kansas, the law has not always been on the side of the people who are getting killed 
and threatened and terrorized. Because in Kansas, there is a strain of the conservative movement and the Republican Party that has tried to put law enforcement on the side of the people who are doing the killing, not the side of the people who need protecting. Here's how Republican Phil Klein ran for office in Kansas in the years after George Tiller had been firebombed and after he had been shot, but before they finally killed him. Now, any of you heard of George Tiller? Yes. George Tiller performs late for abortions down in Wichita. He has for years. Another example in Kansas is George Tiller. Abortionist George Tiller. I want to first tell you who does not endorse Attorney General Phil Klein. Abortionist Dr. George Tiller does not endorse Phil Klein. When Republican Party anti-abortion activist Phil Klein got elected Kansas Attorney General for the whole state uh, in 2002, uh, the complaint by the state bar that just resulted in today's state Supreme Court ruling against him, uh, that complaint explains how just after he was elected, within weeks of him taking office, Phil Klein met immediately with his top staff to try to figure out how he could use the power of the state attorney general's office in Kansas to persecute Dr. George Tiller. Shooting had not worked, firebombing had not worked, so Phil Klein wanted to see if he could come up with a way to use the law to put him out of business. Phil Klein ultimately brought dozens of charges, misdemeanor charges, felony charges, against both Dr. Tiller's clinic and a Planned Parenthood clinic. Dozens of charges, none of which were ever sustained. They were all either thrown out or the clinics were acquitted. Nothing he tried to do in court stuck. But in the course of bringing those charges, Phil Klein and his office used fake statistics and false testimony and just flat out lying to Kansas courts and grand juries to subpoena patient medical records from Kansas abortion clinics. They got people's medical records. To try to protect patients' privacy, the medical records did have the patients' names redacted, but Phil Klein, in his zeal, unredacted the records. He and his staff staked out the parking lot at Dr. Tiller's clinic. They'd lay there in wait and watch the people as they came out. They followed his patients and his employees and his visitors back to their cars and they'd take down the license plate numbers to try to get names and addresses. They went to a hotel that was nearby to the Tiller Clinic and subpoenaed the records from visitors who stayed at that hotel so then they could try to match the names of people staying at the hotel by cross-referencing with medical records from people's abortions to try to put names back on those records even though they'd been redacted. Having thus pieced together records of women's abortions, including names and addresses and phone numbers and identifying information and dates of their abortions and their exact medical histories, having pieced all that together, he then made copies and moved those records from the Attorney General's office to the open garage of one of his employees, to another guy's car, to a local county district attorney's office. At one point, his employees took the full private medical files of a whole bunch of named patients to the local Kinko's and spent a whole bunch of time there copying them and leaving them lying around in public. Eventually, those records ended up in a Rubbermaid tub sitting in a Phil Klein staffer's apartment for more than a month. In the middle of all of this, Phil Klein actually lost his job as Kansas State Attorney General. He was defeated by a Democrat in 2006. His next job was as a local county DA. But to his next job, he took those private medical records with him. The ones he'd been able to get as AG and piece them together from following people around and everything, he took the records with him. Part of the state bar's unprofessional conduct complaint against him is that he lied to the state bar when he told them that those records had always been under lock and key. Not only were they not under lock and key, in the year 2006, they ended up mysteriously on the Bill O'Reilly show, on the O'Reilly Factor on the Fox News channel. It's funny, the tape of that specific night of the O'Reilly show uh, seems to have been scrubbed off the face of the earth. The transcript of it still exists, but you can't find the tape of it anywhere, not even a clip. But Bill O'Reilly somehow obtained all of those Kansas women's medical records, those medical records that had been knocking around in Rubbermaid tubs and cars and garages in Phil Klein's office while he said they were under lock and key. Those records somehow made their way to the producers of the Bill O'Reilly TV show on Fox News. But Phil Klein always denied he had anything to do with that. Well, today, Phil Klein lost his license to practice law by order of a unanimous ruling from the Kansas Supreme Court. He is totally unrepentant. 
He teaches law now at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. That's the conservative Christian school founded by the late Jerry Falwell. Uh, the law school at the Jerry Falwell School says they have no plans to fire Phil Klein or change his teaching responsibilities at the law school now that he has lost his license to practice law for professional misconduct. They say that has nothing to do with whatever it is he's able to impart to conservative law students in Virginia. They are still very happy with him. What remains the most amazing thing about this chapter in bloody, bloody Kansas is the blurring of the line there between the kind of normal anti-abortion politics that are essentially mandatory in the Republican Party right now and the radical offshoot of those policies, the radical variant of those policies that seeks to enforce the anti-abortion doctrine through murder, through violence. Phil Klein was breaking the law and stealing medical records to bring trumped up, soon to be thrown out charges against Dr. George Tiller to try to put him out of business. But almost every day of that trial, there sitting in the audience, was Scott Roeder, the guy who would eventually go on to kill Dr. George Tiller. He was there at the trial when Phil Klein was able to get Tiller in court. Scott Roeder's jailhouse friend, who's now threatening to kill the next abortion doctor in Kansas, the lawyer who was defending her and her Justice Department case, that's him on the left with Angel Dillard. He's the same lawyer who Phil Klein appointed to be his special prosecutor to try to put George Tiller out of business. That means the state of Kansas paid that guy's legal bills. The taxpayers of Kansas did not just pay to defend Phil Klein for all of these ethics charges. They paid the legal bills for that special prosecutor, the guy who himself was one of the Summer of Mercy protesters laying down in front of police cars and trying to shut down Dr. Tiller's clinic back in the 90s. If you live in Kansas, you've been paying him. And when Phil Klein finally got his own day in court, when the hearing started against him, that resulted today in his losing the right to practice law, the courtroom filled up that day in Topeka with his core supporters, the Republican Party's base of hardline supporters for hardline anti-abortion politicians like him. We want to make sure that these people know there are people watching them and that they're accountable to the public. She was there that day that the hearing started against Phil Klein in Topeka, the one that resulted in him losing his law license today. That is the person whose name and number were on the dashboard of Scott Roeder's vehicle when the police pulled him over the morning he murdered George Tiller. That's the policy director for Operation Rescue. She herself has done time for bombing clinics. She's there to support Republican Attorney General Phil Klein all the way in the case that today got him thrown out of the legal profession. Joining us now is Duverne Gaines. She's legal coordinator for the Feminist Majority Foundation. Duverne, it's great to have you here tonight. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Rachel. We have been following the saga of uh, Phil Klein in Kansas uh, for, for a very long time. Is Phil Klein an outlier or does he represent a part of mainstream anti-abortion politics that really has flirted with the violent side? Well, I think that he is... Uh, definitely not mainstream. Hmm. And he has cozied up to and been a member of a group, an enclave within Kansas that has really created, they are extremists. And I would say that he is an extremist. Um, what we see today is, is really a moment of justice for him and a moment of justice in Kansas finally um, here he is, his license is suspended. I wish they had permanently disbarred him, but at least for three years he is, uh, his license has been suspended. Um, but you know, what he did uh, using his position of authority uh, as the Attorney General of Kansas was fan the flames of extremism and Scott Roeder himself cited his acquittal, the acquittal of George Tiller against these totally baseless charges as the reason why he then proceeded to murder him. And, you know, by fanning the flames with these completely baseless, unfounded, bogus criminal charges over and over again, um, someone like a Scott Roeder or perhaps someone like Angel Dillard um, are led to an act of violence. 
To Vern, in your work for the Feminist Majority Foundation, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this tonight um, is that you really do a lot of work focusing on the really radical side of the anti-abortion movement, the people who have excused violence or used violence or threatened violence to try to get their way. What's the status of that part of that movement now after Scott Roeder um, while we're seeing so much mainstream anti-abortion legislation being advanced all over the country? How is that affecting the really violent side of the movement? Well, you are seeing wide scale encouragement and emboldened extremists in state after state after state, mm -hmm. where you see a trap law that's been passed, whether it's Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas. Um, and right now we've got a situation in Albuquerque that's very concerning. You have the extremists now feeling as though they have the run of the place. Mm. It's their day so that they can actually go in, not only intimidate and terrorize, um, but they actually have the backing of a, a legislature um, or an, and an attorney general and or a governor who's going to be saying things and further fanning the flames uh, that create a climate in which violence is possible and takes place and is encouraged. Javern, what's the situation in Albuquerque that you say you find, you find so concerning? Well, um, you know, interestingly enough, Rachel, after, um, right before or shortly after Dr. Tiller was murdered in 2009, a couple named Tara and Bud Shaver uh, moved to Wichita to intern with the uh, with Operation Rescue with Cheryl Sullinger, who has tried to whitewash her past, but of course was a convicted federal felon, a domestic terrorist, who was really the ringleader of a group that attempted to uh, bomb uh, multiple clinics in San Diego. Um, so anyway, they moved to Wichita right around the time of Dr. Tiller's murder and spent a year working with uh, Troy Newman and Cheryl Sullinger studying their storied tactics of terror and intimidation, and then uh, were sent to Albuquerque as missionaries, missionaries for Operation Rescue. There they set up shop, and there they are now relentlessly pursuing providers in that city, and they've essentially declared it the new ground zero. Um, because several of Dr. Tiller's colleagues moved to Albuquerque. They didn't move. They established a practice there with another physician. Hmm. And um, they have managed to put on the ballot um, an anti-abortion ballot measure within the city uh, that will be in a special election there in Albuquerque on November 19th, which would be an abortion ban um, from 20 weeks on. No exception for the health uh, of the mother, uh, no exceptions for rape and incest, no exceptions for the really the life of the mother. It's and they are um, in August. They convened a leadership uh, council that brought in all of these extremists from all over the country to meet with them and have a boot camp training of sorts, which uh, of young adults to go out and carry out their tactics, but also we believe behind the scenes it was an excuse for a leadership meeting to plan the next steps in their campaign against the providers in that city and um, to further the, uh, their campaign of, of terror and intimidation nationwide, not just in Albuquerque, but of course um, we're seeing a, a larger um, uh, assembly of, peop of these groups. Duvern Gaines. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're going to have you back to talk more about Albuquerque. We've been sort of monitoring that, stor that story. Uh, in the background, thinking about this as a new tactic in terms of it being a local ordinance like this, but the militants with which it has been pursued in Albuquerque and its link to that larger national movement um, is really important stuff. So, Duvern Gaines, uh, legal coordinator uh, for the Feminist Majority Foundation. Duvern, thanks for helping us understand it tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. The big